All right, we will begin today's webinar. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, today we're gonna be discussing some end of year planning opportunities that uh, you can take advantage of given the 2018 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was signed into law uh, the end of last year. Today you're gonna hear from myself. I'm Erin Boisin, Director of Financial Planning here at EP Wealth. You're gonna hear from Jennifer Lee, who is our Senior Planner and our financial planners, Brett Panziera and Alina Nar. So we will jump into it. So again, the overall goal of this is to give some high level considerations, things to think about. Um, ultimately, we want to make sure that everyone's consulting with their CPA or tax professional about your specific situation. We're gonna take questions at the end and we do ask that those questions be put into the chat box and that they be general in nature. If you do have specific questions, uh, feel free to contact your advisor here at EP to better answer those for you. So our agenda today, we're gonna jump into kind of what's changed, specifically on the individual and business side, some year-end considerations to uh, make, and then some charitable planning techniques and how we can help with all of this. So when we look at the general changes and notes, you know, one thing that has kind of been up in the air for most of the year now is whether or not a lot of the states were gonna conform um, this to the actual federal changes. So California did not conform. There's also still some rules so what we've seen kind of play out this entire year is a lot of clarity on some of the rules and regulations that were passed at the end of last year. So we expect to see more IRS guidance over the next year, specifically in the beginning of next year as tax season approaches to clear up any of those issues that are kind of gray. Most of the effective dates are January 1st of this year. Uh, the majority of the individual income tax changes are temporary. So December 31st, 2025 is when a lot of these actually expire. You know, something to look at is tax law changes, you know, roughly every 2.25 years. And we don't have that crystal ball to know what it's going to look like in three years and four years, specifically after 2025. Uh, but we do want to make sure that we're planning accordingly for this year. So let's get into the individual provisions. So the biggest change that happened was just a change to tax brackets. So most people will now either fall into the same, if not a lower tax bracket, um, specifically on the federal side we're discussing. Uh, the state side is still you know, what it is. So you can see now we still have a low tax bracket at 10%, um, but our highest oh, tax bracket now is 37. I believe I've muted everyone, but if you haven't muted, uh, muted yourself, please do. So this is just a nice visual to show you, you know, the change in the in individual income tax rates and kind of where you might fall given your taxable income. I think part of the biggest change that most people will see as they go to file their 2018 tax return is going to be around the standard deduction. So what the TCGA, the Tax Cuts and Job Act did, was actually essentially double your standard deduction for joint and single filers. So as a married couple now, you get a $24,000 standard deduction versus in the past, it was only 13. They eliminated the personal exemption. So previously you were given a $4,150 exemption per person. And again, in the past there were phase outs to that. So some people didn't even actually get to recognize those anyway in the past, but now those are gone. And as a way to make up for that, they increased the phase out range and the amount for the child tax credit. So 
Above the line deductions, the biggest change here was as it, uh, with, with alimony. So alimony is now no longer deductible to the payer or taxable to the receiver beginning in 2019. So if your divorces were finalized prior, you'll be grandfathered. Um, this is one of those provisions that does not sunset at the end of 2025. So as you know, if anyone's in the process of divorce, this is something to consider. Uh, student loan interest and HSA deductions were retained. This was something that was being discussed. And there was no changes to retirement plan contributions. For itemized deductions, so again, if we think of the standard deduction and the itemized, this is where on the individual level, most changes happen. This year in particular, they lowered the threshold back to 7.5% of your adjusted gross income to be able to deduct medical expenses as an itemized deduction. Starting in 2019, this threshold goes back to 10%. The, the change that I think affects the most people, especially those of us here in California, those high state tax, um, is the SALT deduction, so the state and local income tax deduction. This is now capped at 10,000. So no matter how much your state taxes are, how much your property taxes, you have a $10,000 limit. Mortgage interest is now also only deductible for new loans up to 750,000. So previously there was a million dollar limit, you now have 750. Any loans open prior to 12-15-2017 are grandfathered. HELOC interest, um, no longer deductible if it's being used for anything other than uh, essentially um, what they're calling acquisition indebtedness or home equity indebtedness. So if you're using the equity towards your home, there is still the opportunity for a deduction. If you're using it for other purposes, so sometimes people take equity lines out to pay for college, pay off credit card debt, buy a car because it's a better use of interest rates, that is no longer deductible. For charitable contributions, the adjusted gross income limit for cash donations to public charities increased from 50% to 60%. And I think another large change on the itemized is essentially everything that is considered below the line. So all the miscellaneous deductions you might have taken in the past, tax prep fees, investment management fees, job-related expenses are no longer deductible. So if you've been paying attention to the news as they've talked about this, a lot more people they estimate will take the standard deduction this year versus itemizing because of these limitations. Long-term capital gains stayed the same. The 3.8 Medicare surtax also was retained. That was something that was being discussed um, to take off the table. The difference here is as you can see, in the chart is where you now fall into the respective brackets. So previously, it was your ordinary income tax bracket. Now it is based on your taxable income, which dictates what your capital gains rate will be. Another big change was to the alternative minimum tax. So I think a lot of people who especially had high state taxes and were thinking of losing that deduction immediately thought, oh my gosh, without these large itemized deductions, I'm going to end up paying a lot more in federal tax now. What we're finding and what we've talked with a lot of different people about is if you are actually paying AMT tax, you probably aren't now because they raised the exemption and limit. So you actually kind of pick up the, the tax savings on the back end. So maybe you're not getting it on the itemized deductions, but now you're no longer actually paying AMT. So you may actually pay less. Again, very specific to your situation, but something to note. So the trust estate and kitty tax. So the estate tax went up to the highest it's ever been. It's now about just about 11.2 per person. So estates essentially over 22.4 million for a married couple, 11.2 uh, for individuals that's when the estate tax will kick in. This is for, uh, set to sunset back um, 
in 2025. So again, when we're talking about planning, this is a very short-term exemption amount, not something we can plan for the long-term on right now. The step up in basis was retained. There was no changes to the annual gift amount, so that has just steadily gone up pretty much each year. This year, it's 15,000 a year that you're allowed to give to any individual without paying uh, gift tax. There are still income tax deductions for trusts and estates, and then kitty tax is now taxed at trust and estate tax rates rather than the parent. So as we flip to the next slide, you're gonna see the difference here. So previously, if your children filed tax returns because of maybe um, UTMA accounts they had, uh, other you know, investment accounts maybe, this is where they would have actually, you know, after the 2100, it would have gone to the parents rate. Well, now it's taxed at the trust and estate tax rates, which actually accumulate much faster, as you can see on the left, than individual tax brackets. So as you look at your, you know, maybe if your children have investments, there might be some opportunity for reallocation if this is a concern that they might creep up into those higher brackets. Other changes we'll discuss, so the 529 plans can now be used to fund K through 12 education up to 10,000 a year per student. And that includes both public, private, and religious schools. We are still eligible for Roth conversions. The ACA individual mandate has been repealed beginning in 2019. It currently does not have a sunset date. And another one is that employees now have until their tax filing deadline, including extensions, to pay back any loans they may have taken from their retirement plans if they terminate or separate from service. So in the past, you had to essentially pay it back or recognize it as a distribution within 60 days. They've now given you a longer time to potentially pay that money back um, if you choose to not take it as a distribution. So I'm going to turn it over to Brett, who's going to discuss some year-end considerations. All right. So given all those changes that Aaron went over, here's an overview of some things maybe to consider on your personal return. So a lot of these boil down to either accelerating income or trying to maximize your deductions or pre-tax benefits. So one thing we always want to do is take advantage of any group benefits or pre-tax stuff that's on your um, employer's uh, benefits package. So usually a 401k or a retirement plan. Deduction stacking for the most part this year is going to come to charitable contributions or donor advised funds, which Alina will go over a little bit more later in order to make that itemized deduction threshold since the standard has gone up. Qualified charitable distributions is a way to um, reduce your income on, on RMBs in order to send that directly to charity rather than to take it as income. We can discuss with our CPAs or tax repairers kind of making adjustments towards the end of the year for withholdings, looking forward to your, what your tax bill or refund is going to be, and then maybe taking a look at it early next year to see if any changes need to be made for the year going forward. Uh, accelerating income on capital gain recognition or recognizing stock options. Uh, if it maybe is a lower tax year, taking advantage of some appreciated positions in order to, to diversify for capital gains um, or the options. This year, the medical threshold for that deduction will be lower. It's 7.5 rather than 10. So if there were any medical expenses this year, it's more likely that those can be partially deductible. And then always remember to use all the money in your flexible spending account because that is use it or lose it for uh, any healthcare expenses. Okay, so remember that your income level will affect uh, your taxes or um, your Medicare premiums as you're entering retirement. So up to 85% of your Social Security benefit is tax dependent on what your income is in retirement. And that Medicare Part B and D premium can be increased based on your income two years prior to retirement. So something to keep 
keep in mind as you're approaching that date. Of course, there is the required minimum distribution at age 70 and a half in retirement. Uh, eventually, it's the IRS wants you to take out a portion of those um, deferred accounts for uh, your retirement accounts. An option that I mentioned earlier that can be taken advantage of is the qualified charitable, charitable deduction uh, of up to 100,000 per year from those rather than taking that as income. A lot of times what we see in plans is lower income between when you retire and when that RMD actually starts, again at age 70 and a half. A lot of times you can delay social security in that period as well. So that may be one of the lower income years that I mentioned that you may consider um, accelerating income, or as you see here, construction. Okay. Always want to take advantage of employer qualified plans to the extent possible. So 401k, 403b, or 457. This year, the maximum is 18,500 plus an additional 6,000 uh, if you're over age 50 and a half. Looks like those are rising to 19,000 with the same uh, catch-up contribution for each individual next year. Um, and then your employer plan may also offer Roth contributions, so that's something that you can take advantage of as well. If that is not available, there's always the IRAs, which have a maximum benefit or contribution of 5.5 with an additional 1,000 catch-up. That is increasing to 6,000 next year, it appears. Uh, the IRAs can be deductible if you are not covered by an employer plan with no max, but if you are covered, there is a phase out, and then there's no contributions after age 70 and a half. Uh, so, as we'll see, potentially an option you can do is Roth conversion if that is where you're at. Roth IRAs are also an option, no deduction there, but um, that money will be tax-free coming out later down the line. There is a phase out there, and I mentioned Roth conversion as a strategy to uh, get money into the Roth if you are phased out. And then always consider an IRA for a non-working spouse as an option to um, contribute to retirement plans. So if you're in those phase outs uh, where you're not able to contribute directly to the Roth or the front door, there's always a backdoor Roth contribution. So the way that works is you would make a non-deductible IRA contribution initially to a traditional IRA, uh, no deduction there, obviously. We would then convert that into a Roth. Uh, would pay taxes on that conversion, but remember that later down the line, that's tax-free, so that could be a good pool of funds to be used later in retirement or as a legacy. Remember, though, that when we do this, you would have to uh, contend with the pro rata tax of all your IRAs, so you have to uh, remember to aggregate those when calculating the tax. So if you have um, other IRA money, this may not be as good of a strategy since those big other IRAs may come into account when calculating tax. Okay. And same thing here, up to 5,500 or 6,500 if 50 or older as a maximum for the backdoor IRA. Okay. Couple other things to consider. These are mostly for healthcare. The health savings account, you can see the deduction amounts there with catch-up contributions. This is really one of the only accounts where it's deductible on the way in and then there's no tax on the way out if you're using it for qualified medical expenses. So it's a really good option in order to uh, use the funds for medical expenses that you would have anyway. It does require that you are enrolled in a high deductible plan um, but this is also available to self-employed individuals as well. Something also to, to think about that we've seen in the past is that um, that catch-up contribution in the HSA for spouses sometimes has to be put into a separate account, which can be a little bit annoying, but um, just something 
to keep in mind. It is available to both uh, husband and spouse. There's also the FSA, which can be used for medical expenses as well. Difference here is that it is use it or lose it. So HSA accounts can carry over and grow. FSA has to be used in the same year. So make sure you're emptying those out each year. And you also aren't able to do both the FSA and the HSA, so it's one or the other. Dependent care FSA is also available. And then sometimes you may have as an option through your employer, most likely a, a TTSA or transit transportation spending account or parking transportation spending account for those expenses uh, as a pre-tax option. All right, so um, I'll continue on some other year-end planning uh, things to consider. And so we already touched on this a little bit, but just kind of summarizes here um, is potentially accelerating itemized deduction in years where if you're very close to the standard deduction, so 12,000 if you're single or 24,000 for married file joint, it may make sense to bunch some of your itemized deductions. Um, so here's a list of some of the common itemized deductions, so mortgage interest. Um, so in this case, there's a limit to how much you can deduct of interest a year. Uh, it's really dependent on how much you accrue for the year. But for example, if you have a very low mortgage balance, you're not even really paying interest anymore, maybe it makes sense just to pay off the mortgage and kind of be done with it. Uh, for property and state taxes, there used to be more opportunity with uh, maybe combining, do, uh, paying two installments at once, so you can get over the hurdle. Uh, but now that it's capped at $10,000 between the two, it's a little more difficult to really do planning around that. So the main ones I would say you can do a little bit more is charitable deductions. Um, so some examples are Goodwill or Salvation Army receipts, keeping good records of any receipts you've um, made of deductions earlier in the year. Um, you can give cash to charity, or even better, you can get a double tax benefit if you can gift appreciated stock because you'll get the charitable deduction for the fair market value, but also avoid the capital gains tax you would have had to incur had you sold it uh, individually. Um, so something to consider use, use, utilizing is a donor advised fund. Uh, we'll talk more about this later in the slide, uh, but I find it's a good way to kind of front load your deductions for maybe two or three years and then use that account as your giving account because you can get the tax deduction in the year of gift but control when you actually make the distribution. It's also really helpful for record keeping if you don't wanna to have to be tracking down every receipt, the donor advised fund does it for you. Um, the other one we already also touched on too is medical expenses. If you know that you're able to bunch procedures into a particular year, uh, that can help you cross the 7.5% or 10% of adjusted gross income threshold a little easier rather than spreading them out and potentially not getting any deduction um, over those years. Um, so you can also consider deferring income if you're in a particular high bracket because you're still working. Um, so if we can defer some of the realizations of tax gains to a lower bracket, such as in retirement, that's usually more ideal. Um, so some possible strategies are looking at your deferred compensation, if that's available to you. Maybe we look at picking a certain period of years that we know you're in a lower tax bracket in retirement. So most commonly, that would be before your required minimum distributions have to start at 70 and a half. Another thing to look at is exercising stock options uh, in various years, how much to do so, depending on when those options vest and when they expire. Uh, and then structuring, if you have a business and you're looking to sell, maybe you do an installment sale over a period of years, so that's um, a little bit more digestible rather than one big tax hit. And then gains on insurance policy. So if you have, if you've decided to cash out a life insurance policy or non-qualified annuity, uh, 
technically the gain above what you contributed is subject to ordinary income tax. So a way to kind of park the funds in a different place, maybe because there are high fees on these policies or you just want to be able to access them at some point, maybe we look at a different year, maybe a year in retirement that you're in a lower bracket to be able to liquidate those policies. Uh, but another option is maybe we 1035 exchange them into another product that either is less expensive or more fits your goals. So capital gains and losses is something we're actively doing throughout the year, but particularly in the fourth quarter. So if you have your EP managed accounts, these are already being taken care of, but if you have assets that are not being managed, um, this is something you may want to look at on your own. Um, so there's something called capital loss harvesting. So this is where we may purposely sell a position so we can capture the loss. Um, the market has been quite volatile the last few weeks, so that's something we're looking at. So at least from a tax standpoint, we can bank those losses to offset any potential gains either later in the year, or in this case, we're getting close to the end of the year, so we have a pretty good idea. Uh, some things you need to be careful of is there is something called wash sale rules. So you have to wait 30 days when you sell something at a loss before you can buy it back. Um, so what we'll do from strategically is we'll, we'll sell the position, but buy maybe the ETF or another position that's very similar. So we're not missing the opportunity of that particular asset class and also not triggering this wash sale rule issue. Uh, so any excess capital losses, so if you have more losses than gains, you can recognize up to $3,000 that can be offset against ordinary income. Uh, but if you have beyond that, anything excess will be carried forward indefinitely. So in the future, if you have gains either from your portfolio or maybe from real estate, that can be used to offset um, those losses or gains. We also look at capital gains harvesting, um, so selecting which investments to uh, to actually sell at a gain. There's no wash sale rule, so you can immediately buy it back, and we use this as a strategy to kind of reset your basis. So, for example, for those of you who maybe have just started in retirement or haven't started required minimum distributions, you may be in a very low tax bracket temporarily. And if that's the case, you maybe want to take advantage of the 0% capital gains bracket and purposely sell positions just enough to still remain in this bracket and allowing now your cost basis to be higher so in the future you won't have uh, built-in gains. Um, we're also actively looking at mutual fund capital gains distribution. Uh, so we just did a call earlier this week about it and so a lot of the mutual funds have started to release information about when, if they are going to have a capital gains distribution. So we've, uh, there are a couple positions we're proactively selling out of uh, before that happens so that we don't cause a big tax liability uh, from that. And then a couple positions we're gonna temporarily sell out of and then get back in so that uh, we avoid this capital gain distribution. Okay, so looking at gifting strategies, um, so 15000 is the annual exclusion. So if you plan on being able to take advantage of that for 2018, that's something you want to do before year end. Um, so this annual exclusion is kind of a freebie that you can do. That's an easy gifting strategy. It doesn't really require much in paperwork, and it doesn't reduce your lifetime exemption of $11.18 million. Uh, so there's no need to file a gift tax return or anything. Um, there's also front-loading a 529 plan. So this is a quick and easy way to get um, assets out of the estate. Um, so you can front-load up to five years of annual exclusion per, per child. Uh, so that's um, 75000 now, but you do have to wait five years. Um, so this may be beneficial, particularly for certain states, um, do give you an income tax deduction for that. So if you have a particularly big year because of retirement or you're selling your business, this may be something to look at. Uh, California in particular does not have that benefit, so that's not as 
as uh, beneficial. Um, looking at gifting appreciated investments, so part of that 15,000 exclusion, you don't have to give in cash, you can give appreciated stock. So this may be beneficial if you have family members or kids who are in a lower tax bracket than you are. Maybe it's better you give them the appreciated stock and they sell at their lower tax bracket than yours. Um, but you do have to be careful of minor kids, especially under 24. If they're still full-time students, you may trigger the kitty tax rules that we discussed earlier. But particularly, if you have kids who are, want to go to grad school, this may be a way to kind of help them fund graduate school is, is using appreciated or very low basis stock so that they can sell at their lower bracket. And if they're over 24, that's we won't have a kitty tax problem there. Okay, so looking at real estate, um, so some of the things that we thought was going to change was uh, uh, the capital gains exclusion from a primary home. So that did not change. It's still 250000 for singles and 500000 that you can claim as an exclusion if you are to sell a primary home. Um, it can be claimed every two years. You just have to have lived in the home for uh, at least two out of the last five years, and that doesn't need to be consecutive. Uh, so, for example, if you may have converted a primary home to a rental home, uh, that may be an option to be looking at that timeline. Are we going to lose that deduction uh, in the near future because of the timeline? Um, there is a step up in basis if the primary home is inherited. So if you have maybe older parents where you're thinking about selling the home, it may be better to wait until the first uh, spouse passes, particularly in California because we have community property tax laws. You do get a full step up in basis. That might be better than uh, prior to that. Uh, rental property, so maybe looking at selling it, if that makes sense. If we look at the real estate analysis and it makes it doesn't make sense to continue keeping it. Um, you may want to wait until retirement when you're in a lower tax bracket. Uh, but if you decide, you know, I still want to have real estate, I just maybe don't like the particular property I have now, you can do a like kind exchange uh, through a 1031 exchange into another rental property and defer the taxes that may be owed. Uh, but from a multi-generational standpoint, tax planning standpoint, you may also want to wait till there's a step up in basis um, to have that inherited so that you can also re-depreciate the property. It just kind of starts over. So next we're going to look at an example of a, a quick example of a calculation that was run to see how someone, in this particular case, a married couple that has $175,000 in income, they have two kids and no child care expenses, how the 2017 law versus 2018 law would have affected them. Um, so I won't read the entire blurb. We can just focus kind of on the differences. So we start off on income with 175,000. Um, the exemption, so that personal exemption now is uh, gone. So that's why it's zero versus before it was about 16,000. Um, in this case, the state income tax was 10,000, property tax was 12,000. You can see we're capped at 10,000. So in this case, the, the property taxes were not uh, taken. Mortgage interest was 25,000. There should have been no change. If, even if your mortgage balance was over 750,000, um, you were grandfathered in. So we don't expect any changes to that. Uh, miscellaneous deductions. So now we're not able to take those deductions. Um, so that's down to zero versus 7,500 previously. You can see the total itemized deductions overall is about 20,000 less. So the taxable income as a result is higher at 140,000 versus 103,000. And so you see the total tax difference is about 5,000 more, but because of the new child tax credit or the increase in amount and the increase in the phase out levels, and this couple was able to take 4,000 in child tax credits. And you can see the total tax liability actually isn't too different. It's about $1,400 more. But I think a lot of clients thought that it would be a lot more dramatic of a change. And for the most part, I would say there has been not too much change. 
and especially if you were paying AMT before your taxes actually went down. So that's pretty much it on the individual side, and um, now we're going to go through the business provision, so I'll turn it back to Erin. All right. So with the business, so a lot of people say that the Tax Cuts and Job Act was really tax law that was heavily in favor uh, for business owners and truthfully probably for charity as well. So I will say to all the business owners that are on the call, I hope that everyone is having a lot of proactive discussions with their CPAs as it pertains to the changes in the business uh, provisions. So one of the bigger changes was that the C Corp tax rate went to 21% which was a big step down from the top marginal rate of 35%. So I think with that, we saw a lot of business owners instantly jump from, okay, I should now you know, maybe go from an S corp to a C corp because that's a really low rate. There's a lot more that plays into it and we'll talk about it as we go through the rest of the changes, but it's not as cut and dry of looking at these numbers and thinking I'm gonna save money. Um, the AMT was repealed at the C corp level. The 50% limitation um, is now only allowable for meals, no longer entertainment. So if you were buying those Laker tickets or uh, other tickets and taking clients out and running them as a business expense, those are no longer eligible um, for deductions, only meals. The net operating loss carryback uh, of two years has been repealed. And now you're only eligible to take a net operating loss um, to, limited to 80% of your taxable income. So previously this had been 100%. So if you had a large net operating loss, what we actually saw were a lot of people being able to take that in one year, essentially drive their taxable income down to zero, if not negative numbers, and then take advantage of Roth conversions or capital gain recognition because they were in lower tax brackets. Now that's subject to 80%. That does still mean though that you can drop yourself into a very low tax bracket. So if you know that you have a net operating loss, I would say definitely make sure that you're getting on the phone with your CPA, with your advisor, because if we do wanna take advantage of other planning strategies, we have a 1231 deadline that is fast approaching. There is also the new employer provided family leave credit. Uh, which was up to 12.5% of the amount of wages paid to qualifying employees while on family and medical leave. Temporary bonus depreciation was put in place, so you can now take an immediate 100% deduction versus having to take it over the specified recovery period. So again, it's not that you're getting an extra deduction, you're just taking it sooner rather than later. So this is very specific to your situation and what your tax uh, might be for the given year. It can be used for both used and new equipment. And the Section 179 expense deduction for small businesses increased to 1 million from 500,000 and the phase out threshold increased to 2.5 million. And right now this is set to go on indefinitely for the Section 179. A large change, and probably I would say for CPAs, financial planners and advisors alike, one of the more confusing ones, has been with the Section 199A deduction for pass-through income. This is a new deduction. It is set to expire in 2025. It pertains to anyone who's considered a sole proprietor, partnership, S-Corp, um, trust in estates that have businesses, uh, real estate investment trusts, and qualified cooperatives. Essentially, the pass-through entities is what you're looking for. It does not include C-Corps or LLCs that are choosing to be taxed as a C-Corp. You get a 20% deduction um, of, from your qualified business income, so QBI might be a term that you hear. It's limited to the lesser of your net qualified business income or individual taxable income before the deduction and after reduction of any net capital gain. So it's a long calculation. It's one that definitely has to be well thought out with your tax preparer. So qualified business income can include all kinds of business income, services, rental real estate. It doesn't factor in your W-2 income. 
if you're taking guaranteed payments as a partner, again, if you're getting paid through a C corporation, and it does not include capital gains. Um, below the line deduction, it doesn't affect you if you itemize. And then if business income is less than zero, there's no deduction allowed and the loss is carried over. So this is just an example to kind of show you um, three business owners with net income, their taxable income. So Susie, Don, and Claude, you can see down below. So these were their respective taxable income with capital gains. So if we look, Again, at the lesser of, we see what their deductions look like. Again, this is a very straightforward example. If you're a sole proprietor, um, you probably have the most straightforward calculation of them all, but something to definitely weigh with your CPA. So this slide kind of highlights the calculation. Um, there are phase outs to the calculation. So for married filing jointly, it's for 315 to 415,000. For everyone else, for single filers, um, it's 157,5275. If you're a specified service business, then anyone above those phase outs, you lose the deduction entirely. If you're within the phase outs, um, you get a portion of it. So if you kind of think of even like, with IRAs, if you're in the deduction limits and you get a portion of that deduction, it works very similar. Um, for all other businesses and taxpayers above the upper ranges, the deductions limited to either 50% of the W-2 wages paid by the business or the sum of 25% of the wages plus 2.5% of the unadjusted basis after acquisition of depreciable property. So your CPA, your tax preparer is going to know all the ins and outs of your business. They're going to know about the unadjusted basis, but it's a conversation you should be having, especially if you're talking about the way your entity is set up, the way you're structuring your income, the way you're structuring distributions. All of that can affect potentially getting this Section 199A deduction. This is what they are conser uh, considering service businesses. So again, these are the industries that are subject to those phase out limits. So, you know, for us here in the financial services world, we're held to that. The healthcare world, law and accounting, um, athletics, engineers and architects, for whatever reason for the law, they are exempt. Um, and a catch all is any trader business where the principal asset of the trader business is the reputation or skill or one of more of its employees. So this is a nice flow chart if you're more visual to try and figure out, will I get this deduction? Um, and again, we are recording the presentation and can provide the slides. So this just kind of walks you through a yes or no little matrix about whether or not you might qualify for the deduction. So in order to get the deduction, you have to have US sourced income, which includes your W-2 wages. It cannot include any investment income. And really what this means is you're gonna have a lot of discussion around wages and ensuring that your wages stay what's considered reasonable compensation. So I think, you know, depending on how you're structured, you know, we heard examples of people rushing to change their W-2 in order to try and maximize the deduction. But again, your W-2 wage has to be considered reasonable compensation for your you know, industry that you're in and needs to be signed off by your CPA. So here are some business considerations. So again, this deduction is only through 2025. So it's a short-term deduction. So maybe you have to start thinking about the long-term planning that you're doing. If you're a new business owner or plan to stay in business for much longer than 2025, restructuring and, re and changing wages, setting up retirement plans, a lot might not make sense depending on the time horizon of your business. Um, you know, concern is why shouldn't I retain earnings in the C Corp? Again, we have the different taxes that are subjected, you're subjected to with C corporations. Your dividends still have to pay out, so you still are subjected to the double taxation that C Corps have. 
So you're paying both the C-Corp and your individual tax rate. In a perfect world, I think most employees would love to change to 1099 because then we'd be able to take advantage of the Section 199 deduction. This, I think, will be something that you know, you'll see more scrutiny on. There already has been several cases, specifically in California, about 1099 independent contractors versus employees. Again, adjusting wages, ensuring you're staying within the realm of reasonable compensation, and making sure you're not giving up any fringe benefits. So it's very particular to your facts, your circumstances, and your business. So some year-end considerations to think about. Conversations, again, if you are a business owner, you absolutely should be having before your end with your CPA and your financial advisor. Reviewing your situation to see if you're eligible for the Section 199A deduction. Possibly adjusting salaries um, for purposes of this deduction. Seeing if you should be taking advantage of the bonus depreciation or section 197 or section 179 deduction. Retirement plans. Uh, we've been seeing a lot more retirement plans get established as a way to drive down that qualifying business income to take advantage of the deduction. Reviewing the structure of your business and then timing business income and deduction. So if again, if depending on how your business is set up, you may have some flexibility in how you take your income and deductions through the business, which may allow income to smooth out over different years to allow you to take some of the deductions that are available right now. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Alina to discuss some charitable planning opportunities to consider. Okay, so charitable planning, as you saw from uh, what Aaron reviewed earlier on the individual side uh, specifically is the charitable deduction is one of the few things that did stay on that itemized deduction um, side of things. So I'll go over some, some of the tools that you can use to maybe take advantage of charitable deductions uh, this year and in the years coming. So the first one being a donor advice fund. So Jen touched on this a little bit um, earlier. But the donor advice fund is a great way to do uh, the deduction stacking or if you're very close to that, uh, if you are very close on the threshold that you can itemize because you don't have enough, so you're taking that standard deduction, this may be a great way to kind of bump, bump you up so you can itemize your deductions. Uh, what's great about the donor advice fund is you can put in your you know, your cash or whatever it is that you want to donate. As you can see, you can do cash, you can do investments and other complex assets. Um, you get the charitable deduction when you do the donation, but then you're able to decide what charities to actually distribute those funds to um, in the future. So especially now that we're coming to the year end, if you don't have specific charities that you donate to already, this is a great way to get your deduction right away, but also take your time to decide which charities you can benefit. Um, the, there is a minimum amount to open a donor advice fund, which is $5,000. Uh, Schwab and Fidelity do offer these um, as options to go through them. And like I said, um, you can donate cash or investments. And the great thing about this, it is like an investment account. So anything that you put in the account, you um, can accumulate and can use to um, kind of donate to different charities over the years and not just in that specific year. Another thing that you can take advantage of, uh, specifically if you are RMD age or required minimum distribution, if you're 70 and a half, you can choose to directly transfer your RMD amount to a qualified charity of your choosing. Uh, one thing to note here that we do get um, questions about is, in this instance, the donor advice fund does not qualify to be the charity um, specifically for this strategy. Um, again, this is a way so you can exclude some of that RMD as taxable income on your tax return. Um, and then another thing uh, to take note of here is there is a maximum maximum annual amount that you can do for the QCD, which is $100,000. Um, 
but as you can see, this is per person. So each spouse can make this um, deduction or contribution from your IRA account. And this is a great way to kind of minimize that taxable income. Uh, some other things that you can do, <clears throat> this one's also can be used as an estate planning tool. But one of the things you may have heard of is a charitable remainder trust. Um, so the setup of this is you potentially make an irrevocable gift into a trust. Um, this is if, something you can consider if you need an immediate charitable deduction, but also maybe a future income stream. What you can do is gift, make a gift to this irrevocable trust and for a number of years or for your lifetime, you can get payments um, as an income stream. And then at the end of that term or your lifetime, the remainder uh, of what's in the trust goes to the charity, uh, to benefit the charity. For this specifically, uh, the charitable deduction, uh, you may be eligible to get that charitable deduction uh, in the beginning when you're actually doing the initial transfer into the trust. Um, other things that you can do is uh, obviously change the beneficiary at any time that you'd like, uh, meaning the charity of your choice that receives the assets in the end, and you can still serve as the trustee um, of that trust. Another thing that's a little bit similar to the charitable remainder trust is kind of the inverse of, um, of the one that I just explained. Um, what happens here is you still make the irrevocable gift to the trust. But instead of you getting those payments for a specific um, term of years or your lifetime, it's actually the charity that's getting the payments, at least on an annual basis. And then the asset reverse, uh, reverts back to most of the time a beneficiary that's a non-charitable beneficiary to receive the assets in the end. So it is a great way uh, to pass appreciated assets to other heirs. Uh, and also potentially reduce um, any gift or estate tax in the future. So lastly here, um, of course, we want to uh, encourage all of you to do your financial plan if you haven't. So a very big goal of us here at EP is to help put together a comprehensive financial plan where we look at all of the areas that we um, reviewed today to make sure that you are maximizing any strategies that you can take advantage of, um, specifically when it comes to tax planning, but of course other areas of financial planning as well. So if you haven't done a financial plan, definitely contact your advisor and we can help you through the process. Um, if, like Aaron said in the beginning, if there's any specific questions to your situation that you have, uh, definitely speak to your advisor and we can help you there. Um, otherwise, we can start taking some general questions. I know um, we have some questions in the chat box, uh, but there is a chat box feature in the meeting, so you can type in your question there, and we can get going on those. All right. So as I pull that up, I'm just going to...